All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on linear algebra. We have been working in this section here on eigenvalues and eigenvectors now for a little bit. And in the most recent video, we talked about the change of basis matrix, right? And there were two goals in, in doing that and in introducing this type of matrix. The first was, I mean, just to introduce it for its own sake, just to say, here's how the, the change of basis matrix is defined. And here's how it can get used to, to transform both vectors and matrices from one basis to another. So, so that, would, that was the first goal. But the second goal, which we talked about in the, the last video, was to, to build the foundation for this concept called diagonalizable matrices. Right? We said that we want to ultimately talk about diagonalizable matrices, what they are and why they are important. But we need to introduce these guys, the change of basis matrices, first. And as you can probably tell by the title of the video, we are now ready to introduce diagonalizable matrices, right? So that's what, that's what this video is going to be about. We're going to be first saying, what are diagonalizable matrices? And then how do they relate to eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Because the, the entire last video was almost uh, completely devoid of talking about these guys at all. I don't even know if we mentioned those words um, in the last video. So eventually we're going to, we're going to tie everything together and make a bunch of connections, which is, which is always really good. So, so hopefully that makes sense. And before we get started in, in doing that though, I just want to recap what we did a little bit in the last video. And what we have written right here is just a summary of kind of the main results in the last video. Okay. So, so we started with two different bases. The first being this arrowed basis E1 through EN and the second being the squiggle basis E1 through EN. They're both bases of Rn. And we wanted to, to start out by just relating these two bases to each other. In other words, how can we express one basis, maybe the squiggle basis, in terms of the other one, the error basis? And we could do that with a system of linear equations, of n linear equations, and the jth linear equation, one of the n linear equations, would have this form right here. And so it'd be represented. As, as, as this equation right here where we had a bunch of different coefficients um, multiplying every single uh, basis vector in the error basis. And then we said that these coefficients, when we look at all of the n different linear equations, make up the change of basis matrix. And this equation right here relating one basis to another, this is how the change of basis matrix, which we call P, is actually defined. So we started the video talking about that, and then we said, okay, once we assume that, that, that this is, or once we have an understanding that this is how our matrix P is defined by this equation right here, then we can apply it to, to see how we can take vectors and, and transform them from one basis to another. This was the expression for that. And then the same thing with matrices. If we had a matrix uh, and we wanted to, if we had a matrix A, we wanted to express it in terms of a different basis, a squiggle. This would be the expression for that. Okay. So hopefully all of these ideas either sound familiar and or make sense. Hopefully both, right? So what, what I want to do to start talking about some new stuff is to kind of pick up where we left off right here. Uh, it turns out that the matrices A and A squiggle have a certain term. And the term, I think, is relatively intuitive to describe them, and we'll see why in a second. But I'm going to first write out what the definition is to describe how these two matrices are related, and then we're going to go through that together. Okay, so we have this class of matrices here called similar matrices. So let's go through it together. So it says here that two n by n matrices, which we can denote as A or B, A and B, are considered similar to each other if there exists an invertible matrix P such that B equals P inverse AP. Okay. And the reason why I left this definition, or why I left the, the recap on the top half of the board and did not erase it was because you might notice that this equation to describe that A and B are similar 
is identical to the equation to describe the change of basis uh, formula for between matrices. Okay. So, so really what we're trying to say with this definition is that if we have two matrices that represent the same transformation, but just in two different bases, like two different languages, we can call these two matrices similar. And hopefully that's intuitive, right? Because after all, if you're talking about the same transformation, but just expressed in different languages, like if it's expressed in English versus Spanish versus, um, you know, French or whatever, then you're still talking about the same concept. And hence, there's this notion of similarity. You almost want to call them the same matrices, but that's not the, that's not the term that we use, right? But anyways, we, we happen to call these guys or we call these guys similar matrices if they are related by this equation. The reason why the matrix needs to be invertible, by the way, hopefully it's clear, but, but if not, the equation inherently has P inverse, right? So you gotta have P, the P, matrix P has to be invertible, right? Otherwise, otherwise the equation doesn't work, okay? So, so, so yeah, this is how we can uh, define similar matrices. Now, before we, we start saying, well, what can we say about similar matrices, before we start going into different properties of similar matrices, I want to just quickly mention something that is more group theory related. Because right now I'm making a group theory playlist at the same time. So I like making connections between linear algebra and group theory whenever possible. And after all, part of the reason why I have been making the two video series simultaneously is because there are so many overlapping concepts between the, the two. So, so this will be a slight tangent, but, but if you're interested, this is, this is for you. So if you remember in the, the group theory video series that we can talk about these things called the group actions, which is how group elements act on set elements. And we came up with this compact notation where we, this is not the exact, uh, or this is not the literal picture as to what's going on, but a simplified notation to describe that as having a group element act on a set element. And in that video series, we talked about different types of actions. And there was a very important type of action, one of the important types of actions that we talked about, which was the conjugate action, which is when you have a group acting on itself, then it can act via conjugation by this equation right here. And we, we called all the possible outputs or the orbits of the conjugate action, we call those the conjugacy classes of X, right? And in talking about those, we, we said that we came up with our own name for the orbits. Group actions in general will have orbits, but, but for the conjugate action specifically, they, they are called conjugacy classes. So there's obviously this importance to talking about the conjugate action. And when describing the conjugate action, we said that there is this inherent sense of sameness between elements that are conjugate. In other words, the, the quantity GXG inverse and X are quote unquote the same because they are conjugate to each other. One way to help us understand why that is the case is because if we were to replace G and X with various matrices, then we would see that, that we have just this picture right here. Algebraic, from an algebraic standpoint, this is identical to this, right? If the group acting on itself is a set of, is the general linear group, this is a set of uh, n by n invertible matrices. I realized as I'm saying that too, that we have not talked about the general linear group in this video series. That is also a video that's in the group theory series. So really emphasizing that, that this will hopefully make sense if we've watched the group theory video series. But, but anyways, we, we said that there's this sense of sameness and I think you can really understand that if you think about this group action in terms of matrices. Because after all, if the whole idea is that A and B are the same transformation but just expressed in terms of two different bases, we really can get a, a visual picture for the fact that, that these elements they're just a more abstract version of, of what we have right here. They are the same quantity written in terms of a different language. And it's just that that language appears more abstract when written in terms of group theory notation as opposed to, to looking at matrices. Okay. 
So, so hopefully that makes sense. This, this is this is part of why we can we can think of uh, conjugate elements as being quote unquote the same. Anyways, I, I as, as much as I, I want to talk about about group theory and, and just the, the connections between the two, I is, I should be sticking to to linear algebra, right? So point here is that, that we define these things called called similar matrices. The the next question that will naturally come up as you say, okay, well, I have these matrices A and B that are similar. Cool, right? But, but what can we actually say about them? Like, what are some properties of these similar matrices? And it turns out that they have a lot of really interesting properties, a lot of things that happen to be the same between A and B, which after all, that kind of should make sense if they correspond to the same transformation in two different languages, right? So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to erase the board, and then we're going to prove some basic properties of, of similar matrices next. Okay, so we're going to look at some properties of similar matrices. And it turns out that a lot of the quantities associated with just matrices in general happen to be the same when two matrices, excuse me, two matrices are similar. And maybe just real quick, I'll write out the definition for two similar matrices, A and B, up here, just so we have it. Right. But it turns out A and B, if they're related by that, that equation up there, then they're going to have the same determinant, the same trace, and the same characteristic polynomial. And we're just going to prove that right now. Right? So let's start with the, the first property that they have the same determinant. And I'm just going to start with the equation, the definition for what it means for A and B to be similar. So we're going to have B equals P A or P immerse AP like this. And then we're just going to take the determinant of both sides. So the determinant of B equals the determinant of the right hand side. P inverse AP. Then we know from properties of determinants that we can break this quantity up into a product of the determinant of each matrix individually. So this should really equal the determinant of P inverse times the determinant of A times the determinant of P, like this. Then hopefully we know that the determinant of P inverse is just going to be 1 over the determinant of P. Hopefully you've gone through that before. If not, it's really easy to see. I can actually just do it real quickly here. If we have any matrix times its inverse, that needs to be the identity, right? So if you take the determinant of both sides, you're going to get the determinant of P, P inverse, or in other words, the determinant of P times the determinant of P inverse equals the determinant of the identity, which is just the number one. So then you algebraically solve for the determinant of P inverse and you get that it's one divided by the, the determinant of P or this. So that's what we have right here on uh, the right hand side. So then we can just cancel out factors of the determinant of P and then we're left with the, our solution. that The determinant of B is equal to the determinant of A. Hence, similar matrices have the same determinant. So hopefully that makes sense. Now we're just going to go on to the, the second part, right? Where we want to show that they have the same trace. So if you remember, the trace of a matrix says that, or the trace of a matrix is simply to take the sum of the main diagonal elements. So if I were to take the trace of my matrix B, what we're inherently doing is we are summing from 1 to n, assuming these are n by n matrices, summing up all the elements where the row index is equal to the column index, like this. Now, for this proof, what we're going to do is, is we're going to use Einstein's summation rotation, and we'll see why in a second. We're going to have multiple indices kind of moving around here. But I'm just going to write b sub ii like this. If we remember, Einstein's summation notation tells us that if we have two of the same index in a quantity. So in here we have two factors of i, 
then there is a the, the summation symbol out in front is implied. We don't write it, but it's we assume that it's still there just to be more compact with our notation. So right now we have this quantity b sub i i, and that's going to denote the trace of b. And then we want to just rewrite that or rewrite now the right hand side using Einstein summation notation. And to to do this, we're gonna Hopefully this, this makes sense that I, I'm going to refer back to just how we can use Einstein's summation notation to denote a single matrix product, and then we're going to generalize it for, for this product right here. So let's say that I have a matrix M that happens to be the product of two matrices A times B. The way that I could write out the ij element of my matrix M is to say that I can take a sub i k and maybe b sub k j, where there's inherent summation over k. And, and when there's inherent summation over k, that means that, that the, you can imagine this would be a i1, b 1j, plus a i2, b 2j, and it would continue onwards up through n. So the only quantities only indices that are still free that are left over are i and j, and that's what we have right here. So this is the relation to relate, or how we can use Einstein's summation notation to denote a single product. We're just going to do that multiple times now. So if we're taking p inverse multiplying a, like this, I know that my, my first index, let, let's look at maybe the first index on m. The first index on m is i. And that corresponds to the first index on the first matrix. So I know the first index on my first matrix needs to be I. The second one is this index that gets summed over and call it J. So that forces this first index to be J like this. But then we also have to keep in mind that A isn't a product with this matrix P. So even though the second index is I, we don't want to make this I because that's, we want that to be the outer index on P. So we're gonna come up with another index k, like this. And then when we multiply p, same thing, the inner letters or inner indices have to match. So we have j with j, k with k, and then we see that we have an i in the front to represent this, and then an i at the end, which gets represented right here, okay? So this is a, a, a long, winded way, but hopefully it makes sense to say that this is how we can represent the matrix product P inverse AP using Einstein summation notation. The reason why I'm opting to do this as opposed to not using <laughs> Einstein summation notation is because we have, we have two, let's look at the right hand side, right? We have two factors of I, two factors of J, and two factors of K. So there are three inherent summations that we would have to write if we were to not use Einstein summation notation. Okay. Now you might be asking too, why are we using indices at all in, in the first place? Why not? This seems simpler than this. And, and I agree, but, but there's actually a usefulness in using Einstein summation notation that, actually I'll keep that up there, that maybe we may or may not have forgotten about, but if we have forgotten, I'll, I'll remind us right now. The convenience of doing that, of, of part of the convenience of using Einstein summation notation, is that in this equation right here, where we are not using the summation notation, we have a product of matrices. And matrices do not commute with each other in the general case. Sometimes they do, but not always. So it's not, we can't simply say, let's just swap A and P inverse or A and P with each other. That's not allowed by the rules of matrices. But this equation right here with Einstein summation notation, it corresponds to, to the matrix equation, but now we're looking not at the matrices themselves, but the elements of each of these matrices. This is the i, I element. This is the i j, the j k, the k i element of the B, P inverse A and P matrices. And that's different because the structure of elements of matrices are different than the structure of matrices themselves. We can interchange the order of, of these quantities because they are scalars, right? Like if, if you had a, a two by two matrix, one, two, three, four, 
you can't commute that with another two by two matrix, but, but the elements themselves are just numbers and you can commute numbers, right? So that's what we're gonna do right here. In this next line, I'm going to rewrite, I'm gonna move things around. I'll, I'll move, let's see, I'll move A out to the front. So we have A, J, K out to the front. And then I'm gonna have P sub K I, and then P inverse I, J, like this. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So, so just moving around scalars, it's just a product of scalars right here. Now, the reason why I chose this order specifically and not A, P inverse P, is that look at the inner indices here. The inner indices still match up. We have an A um, on the, the column index right here, in, or sorry, we have an I on the column index right here, and an I on the row index right here. So what that tells us is that we can now retransform this it's, instead of not using, what am I trying to say? Instead of not using scalar quantities, we can reintroduce this as an overall matrix. In case that's confusing, let's, let's just maybe isolate this. I'll put this in parentheses right here. This is, if we thought of this as a product of matrices, like what we have over here in our general example, Notice that in the general example, in order to, to go from the element equation to the matrix equation, the inner indices needed to match, right? So that's how we could go from here up to here or vice versa. We started going from here down to here, but it's in, we can go from here up to here if the inner indices match. So now let's just do that with this equation because the inner indices match. So I'm still gonna have A, jk and then rather than writing this expression i'm just going to write the product of matrices pp inverse like this okay now you might be noticing or you might be asking well this quantity right here has a summation over i but the the indices j and k are still free so we still need to include those down here so we still need to include a factor of k, sub j, or k and j down here. In case we don't see why, let, maybe let me just rewrite the matrix M and let me, let me do this. I could also say that this is the product AB and the ijth element of AB, right? And hopefully that makes M ij is the, the ijth element of AB. Okay, so, so there's this similar structure going on here, but, but, but having the inner indices match is what allows me to go from here to here. Now, what do we know P times P inverse needs to be? Well, P times P inverse is the identity matrix, but the way that we can represent the identity matrix using Einstein's summation notation is with the Kronecker delta symbol, right? And, and this is a bit of a throwback, I guess, but delta, delta kj where it's going to equal one if k equals j and zero if k does not equal j, right? It's just a way that we can represent the identity matrix using Einstein's summation notation. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to rewrite the term in parentheses and just replace it with the delta symbol. So we have a j k and then delta with these two indices, kj, like this. So we have this expression now, and then it's just a matter of asking, well, what, what does the delta function do? Well, it's the only way that we're gonna get a non-zero term, like how this is defined, is when k is equal to j. So when we replace k with j, everything else is gonna be zero, so, so all the other terms are gonna vanish, right? So what, the, so what we can do, and what we've done in, in the, the videos on Einstein's summation notation, is we can effectively remove the delta sign if we set k to be j or j to be k. It doesn't, doesn't matter which one. So this is equal to this, a sub jj. So we have a lot of different equalities going on here, but let's, let's remember what we started with. We started with b sub i i, and now we've ended with this thing called a sub jj. And this would be the proof that the traces are the same. In order to, to see that, maybe let's throw the summation back in. The trace of B 
is the summation from i equals one to n of b sub i i, or just b sub i i. So a sub j j is really the sum going from j equals one to n, a sub j j. And we see how the index doesn't matter. Whether I call the summation index i or whether I call it j, it's the same thing. So this is the trace of a. So this would be the proof to show that similar matrices have the same trace. Now, for, for the, the final part, hopefully all this makes sense. For the final part, we want to show that similar matrices are going to have the same characteristic polynomial. And to do that, same thing. I'm going to kind of just start with, with my left-hand side here, where I can, I'm going to take P sub B of lambda. And this quantity we've more just recently introduced in this section here, in the, the new section, right? But if we remember what it is, the characteristic polynomial is just the determinant of b minus lambda i, like this. Okay. Now, if b is similar to a, then we can, then b is equal to p inverse a p. So we can write b as that quantity. We can write this as p inverse a p, like this. So that, that would be my, my expression for b. Then I'm going to subtract lambda from it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite i as having a similar structure to right here as p inverse i p. To see why, you can imagine that that uh, well, well, I guess hopefully this makes sense, but but I'll just be very thorough. P inverse IP is the same thing as P inverse identity times anything is this thing itself, so P inverse P, and then P inverse P is just I, which is what that quantity is, right? So that's how we can rewrite that. And now this is this is cool because it seems like they both have the same structure. P inverse something times P, and then P inverse something times P. We have a factor of lambda out front, but it's just a scalar, so we can move it around. We Honestly, we could just do this. We could really just write, to make it real clear, we could write p inverse lambda i p like that. Same thing, and we, again, we can do that because lambda is a scalar. And now what we can do is we can just factor out a factor of p inverse on the left and a factor of p on the right. And we're allowed to do this, even though matrices don't commute, because the order is preserved. P inverse is always on the left, and P is always on the right. So we can say that this is the determinant. Actually, make a little more space here. This is the determinant of P inverse. And then the, the thing sandwiched in the middle here is, is A minus lambda I. So A minus lambda I times P like this. So just so just uh, taking out the P inverse on the left and P on the right. And then the proof is, is essentially the same as, as the determinant proof. We have the determinant of something times something times something. You split that up into the determinant of P inverse, the determinant of A minus lambda I, you can probably see where this is going, right? Times the determinant of P, We've already shown how these guys cancel, and what we're left with is just the determinant of a minus lambda i. And or hence, p sub a of lambda, which is the characteristic polynomial for a. All right. So we've just shown for each of these three cases that similar matrices have the same determinant, trace, characteristic polynomial. Okay. Now. In all of this, we might be saying, that, sure, okay, this is cool, right? But but the, the title of the video is, is on diagonalizable matrices. Why haven't we got to those yet? And more importantly, how does any of this relate to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which it seems like we've been on this, this, this tangent now for a while, right? Well, good news. This is the point where we can start saying, well, let's now tie everything in together. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase the board and then we're going to, to introduce the definition of a diagonalizable matrix and see that it's really just a specific case of similar matrices. So I'm going to erase the board and then we're going to do that next.
Okay, so we have arrived at the, the definition which I've been waiting to arrive at for, for a while now. But we are finally here, the diagonalizable matrix. Let's go through it together. So it says that an N by N matrix A is considered diagonalizable if it is similar to a diagonal matrix. All right. Now, first thing is, is like, okay, this is, this is a, a convenient phrase to describe a type of matrix just because it is similar to a diagonal matrix. It makes it easy to remember, right? So just to make sure that we're, we're clear on, on what this is, if B is not just similar to a, a matrix, well, we, we can start with B is similar to a matrix A, but notice that in the definition of similar matrices, similar matrices always come in pairs. We say B is similar to A if this is true, or we could isolate for A and say that A equals PBP inverse. And you say this is true. If these two equations are true, then A and B are similar to each other. Whereas with a diagonal matrix, we're only talking about a, a single matrix A. Notice there's no A and B in this definition. So, so what this is telling us is that a single matrix A is diagonalizable if it can be written as P inverse times some matrix, which maybe I'll just write has coefficients. Let's do this. Lambda one one. Or let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Might be some foreshadowing. <laughs> We're gonna have lambda one, lambda two, dot dot dot, lambda n. So a diagonal matrix with some set of scalars, which I'm conveniently naming, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, through lambda n, along the main diagonal, and it's gonna have zeros everywhere else, and then a matrix P, like this. If this is the case, then A is diagonalizable. Now, we might not see the connection, so we might be saying, okay, cool, a, mat a diagonalizable matrix is a special type of of similar matrix if it's if it's similar with the diagonal one right but how does that relate to eigenvalues and eigenvectors and I am trying to hint at it without saying it immediately and, and the reason why I, I'm not jumping right into it is because there is a set of concepts that that we're gonna finish the video out with that we skipped over initially if you've been following along in Dexter's notes he make he goes through a couple of really important proofs early on but the reason why those proofs are important don't become relevant until now, which is why I've been saving them up until this point. So what I'm gonna do now, and this is where we're gonna tie everything together, where you're really gonna see how everything we've been talking about relates back to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, is we're gonna go through those proofs now. So just, just hang with me, at least in the beginning. It might not seem obvious, but we're gonna connect all the dots by the end of the video. So uh, assuming that, that this makes sense, just similar to a diagonal matrix, I'm gonna write out the first claim that's necessary to understand all this stuff, and then we're gonna go through that claim next. All right, so first thing we're gonna need to do to start connecting all the dots is this theorem right here. It says, suppose that we have an n by n matrix A, which has n distinct eigenvalues, which are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, all the way through lambda sub n. Then the corresponding eigenvectors to those eigenvalues, which are going to denote v sub 1, v sub 2, all the way through v sub n, are linearly independent. And it's almost like, finally, we're getting back into eigen stuff, right, in the section on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's, let's go through proving this. So the standard proof for this is, is you do a proof by contradiction where you actually assume that the set of n vectors are linearly dependent. And what we're gonna do is that if these are linearly dependent, then we can come up with a non-trivial linear combination of these vectors, which equals the zero vector. Here's, here's what I mean. Let's suppose we have C1, V1 plus C2, V2, all the way through some, up to some term CR, VR, which gives us the zero vector. And each of these coefficients, C1, C2, C3, all the way through C sub R, they are all non-zero. Now you might be saying, why do we have 
r instead of n. There are n vectors here, right? Well, maybe, maybe out of the, that r is going to be less than n. Maybe let's say that there are some other vectors as well that could add up to this linear combination. Let's just say I, I have, let's say these are, let's, let's do this. Let's say these are the first r vectors out of my n. So v1, v2, v3, vr, and then there are some after that, uh, that including v sub n that uh, are not included in this equation right here. I could add on the additional vectors to add up to n that are not already included in here. Like I could add v sub n like this, but what I could do is, is I could multiply it by zero and hence I, I wouldn't need it. You could also make the case that I could add like some constant c sub n v sub n plus c sub n minus one v sub n minus one such that these two terms cancel out and then this equation is still true. And you could do that. So you might be asking, well, why aren't we doing that? Why, why are we starting with, with just this? Only r terms out of n, where we're going to say that r is less than or equal to n. And the reason why is because we're going to put a, a condition on this, where this is the, we're going to say this is the, the smallest linear combination of terms which give us the zero vector. Smallest linear combination of terms which give us the zero vector. So, so we can, hopefully we're seeing the logic here. So uh, may, maybe let me just go back a little bit into the big picture thing so, so we're not getting too lost. If, if V1 through Vn are linearly independent, which is what we're really trying to show, then the only way that you can take a linear combination of these guys and get the zero vector is if all the coefficients here, c1, c2, c whatever, are zero. We're assuming the opposite. We're assuming some coefficients can be non-zero. And as we just showed, there are different ways you could achieve having non-zero non coefficients adding up to the zero vector if these guys are linearly dependent. We're just going to pick c1, c2, through CR to be the smallest linear combination. Let's suppose out of all possible linear combinations, this is the smallest one, okay? That's gonna be crucial for the proof. So hopefully that makes sense. We're, we're allowed to choose the smallest possible linear combination. So we have this expression, and now what we can do is let's just apply a certain matrix to both sides of the equation. And we're going to pick a convenient one. I'm gonna pick A minus lambda one I, and we're going to have that act on each term, each vector in, in this equation. So we're going to have this act on C1, V1. I can move the constant out front, so I can say C1 times the matrix times the vector V1, plus C2 times the matrix A minus lambda 1 I V2 plus dot, 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 all the way through CR, A minus lambda one I, VR. And then when any matrix, in this case, A minus lambda one I, when a matrix acts on the zero vector, you get the zero vector. So the right-hand side is still the zero vector. Okay. So just taking this matrix, applying it to this equation right here. And now let's see what we get. So I'm just going to really focus in on, on, on this term to start with. We're just going to look at this term. So we still have C1 out in the front. If we were to distribute V1 into both of these terms in parentheses, because this is a matrix, this is a matrix, I being the identity matrix, we would have A V1 minus lambda 1 I V1. Let's look at A times V1. We automatically know what A times V1 is because we know that V1 is an eigenvector of A. And in general, if we have an eigenvector a v equals lambda v, we know that the, the eigenvector v1 has an eigenvalue lambda 1. So instead of writing a v1, let's write lambda 1 v1. Okay. Then we have a minus sign. Then we have lambda 1 i times v1. 
But the identity matrix times any vector is just the vector itself. So that's just lambda one times V one. We see something times itself. This is gonna cancel out. Go on to the next term. Then we're gonna have C two. A times V two is gonna give us lambda two V two like this. And then minus lambda one I times V2 is still just V2. So now we don't have exactly the same thing. So we're going to keep going. This is going to continue on all the way through the, the rth term, which is going to be C sub R. And then just going through the same logic, we're going to have lambda, lambda R V sub R minus lambda 1 V sub R, still giving us the zero vector. Okay. Now all we can do, or, or what we're going to do, is we're just going to factor out. No, notice in this first term, we have a V2 here and a V2 here. We have a VR here and a VR, two, VR here. We're just going to factor those out of the equation. And what we're left with is we're going to have C2, lambda 2 minus lambda 1, V2, plus, dot, 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 plus CR, Lambda R minus Lambda 1 VR gives us the zero vector. Okay. Now, this is where the, the, the part where the matrix has distinct eigenvalues comes into play. We knew that this term canceled out because you have something minus itself. Then you ask yourself, does anything else cancel out? Well, we know the coefficients have to be non-zero. So C2, C3, all the way through CR, those have to be non-zero because we set it up that way. We defined that these were the non-zero coefficients. Then for the remaining terms in parentheses, because they're all distinct, we're going to have something minus something else or something that's non-zero. And that's important. That's important because now we have a combination. We now have a linear combination of not V1 through VR, but we have a linear combination of V2 through VR, where each of the coefficients in front of our vectors V2 through VR are non-zero. This is non-zero, this is non-zero. And hence we found a shorter linear combination of eigenvectors which adds up to the zero vector. That contradicts this claim because we originally said this was gonna be the shortest linear combination. Okay. And hence our original assumption that the eigenvectors were linearly dependent is false forcing them to be linearly independent. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. To see why this would break down if the eigenvalues were not distinct, it, the, the idea is that when you get to this step right here, we have the, the only reason that this is going to work is because every coefficient in front of the eigenvector, whether it's V2, V3 through VR, each of these coefficients right here are non-zero. The only way you can enforce that they're non-zero, you already know the C values are non-zero, but you need to make sure that lambda, the term in parentheses is non-zero. So this is different from this, this is different from this. And every eigenvalue is going to be different from, from, from lambda one, and you could do this for anyone. We chose the matrix A minus lambda one I, but I could have chose any of the eigenvalues, lambda whatever, in lambda one through lambda n. Okay. So that is the first piece in, in understanding this. Right. So if that makes sense, which hopefully it does, we're gonna erase the board and then really start to make some connections to finish off the video. All right, so sorry for the cut there. The One of the weird things that occasionally happens, the video recording got messed up at the end, so just redoing the last part. But I'm more than happy to redo this last part because this is, in my opinion, at least the, really the fun part where we start to connect all the dots in the past several videos. Everything should hopefully, if I do it right, everything should hopefully make sense by, by the end of this where, where everything fits in. Okay. So in the, the previous whiteboard, what we showed is that if we have an N by N matrix A and it has, well, well maybe let me first say, if A is an N by N matrix, it's going to be, it's going to be a map from Rn to Rn. Okay? So N by N matrices map from here to here. 
And if A has a set of N distinct eigenvalues, so lambda one, lambda two, all the way through lambda N, then their corresponding eigenvectors, V1, V2, all the way through Vn are linearly independent. Let's just now take a moment to, to think about what that implies, all right? So we have a set of n linearly independent, well, we have a set of linearly independent vectors, and because there are n of them, that means the span of those linearly in independent vectors is n-dimensional. They span in n-dimensional space. Because the vector space we are working in is n-dimensional, they span the entire vector space. And then we ask ourselves, what is a term that we have come up with to describe a set of vectors which are linearly independent and span the entire vector space? Well, we call that a basis, right? So, so what we have just found is that the set of eigenvectors, in this case where you have independent or unique eigenvalues, forms a basis. And what we can call a basis full of eigenvectors is we can call it an eigen basis, all right? And now hopefully the wheels start to turn, right? Because the, the, the previous video, we were talking about changing bases. So, so we're starting to make these connections, okay? But, but before we, we jump into things, before we dive into things, I want us to, to go back to a concept that we were talking about much earlier on in the video series that helped us understand how numbers were arranged in a matrix or how elements of the matrix were arranged. So I'm just gonna go with a, a simple example, a two by two example. Let's say our matrix A is two by two and it has elements A, B, C, and D. We said that we could think, but when we look at this matrix, like in the literal sense, when we look at the numbers A, B, C, and D in the grid, we can think of A, C as the output of when A acts on the one zero vector. Let me write this out here. When A acts on the one zero vector, we get AC. And then same thing with, and that's our first column. The second column can be thought of as when A acts on the zero one vector, we get BD. And if you don't believe me, just plug in, take the vector one zero, put it here, do matrix multiplication and take the vector zero one, put it here. This is what you're gonna get, right? So this is how we were able to, to think of the columns of the matrix. They tell us the, the visual output as to where the one zero and the zero one vector go. Now the new part that we're gonna add in now, what we were talking about in the last video, is that we, we now know the idea that every vector or, or matrix, they're written with respect to a certain type of basis. And usually the, the common basis that we work with is what's called the standard basis. So when we were to, if we were to write out, let me do this, let's say this is a standard basis. So if we were to write out the vector one zero, this is, if we were to write it with respect to the standard basis, the i hat, j hat, k hat basis, what this vector corresponds to is the vector one times i hat plus zero times j hat, right? Now, th this, is, this is where we can also uh, incorporate this right here. What if we were to write out the vector one zero, but it's no longer written in the standard basis, it's written in terms of the eigen basis? Well, now the one zero vector is simply gonna be one times v1 plus one times v2, where v1 and v2 are going to be the two eigenvectors of, uh, the two linearly independent eigenvectors of A, okay? So, so hopefully that makes sense. We can, this vector, the, the literal column vector that I'm writing with my marker, one zero, can be, can mean different things depending on what language, what basis we write that vector in. Now, in the general case, when A acts on the one zero vector, it'll go to something. When A acts on the zero one vector, it'll go to something. What I want to see though, is I wanna see what happens if 
when a acts on the one zero vector and the one zero vector is written in terms of the eigenbasis. So when we write one zero, this is what we mean. We mean one times the first eigenvector, whoops, <laughs> should be zero, <laughs> plus z zero times the second eigenvector. Okay, and, and let's see what happens to the transformation. I realize I'm a little all over the board here, but, but hopefully we can still follow. So when A acts on this vector right here, so the one zero vector in the eigenbasis, that's one times V1 plus zero times V2. I'm gonna have, I can distribute this in and I'm gonna get one times AV1 plus zero times AV2. Zero, because that zero is gonna cancel and I'm left with just AV1 and I know that because V1 is an eigenvector, this is gonna equal lambda one times V1. Or in other words, lambda one times V1 plus zero times V2, okay? So then we can ask ourselves, okay, if this is what the output is of when A acts on this vector, how can we rewrite this as a column vector? We started with one zero as a column vector, where the top component was the scalar multiplying V1 and zero was the bottom component multiplying V2. Well, now we just have lambda one, which would be our top component, because lambda one is multiplying V1 and zero is still multiplying V2. So this vector right here, when written in the eigenbasis, is lambda one times zero. And you could do the exact same thing with, with this bottom vector. Rather than having the one zero vector, if you had the zero one vector written in terms of the eigenbasis, that would be zero times V1 plus one times V2. Let's even do that right here. A times zero one, where this is in the eigenbasis, that's going to give us zero times lambda two by the same logic. Hopefully we're able to follow that. And that tells us something, because now what we can do is we can say, well, when this matrix is written in the eigenbasis, what are its columns? Well, the columns, this would be the first column right here, because this is the one zero vector. So let's replace A and C with this lambda one zero, lambda one zero. And this would be the second column, zero lambda two. And if we notice, this has a similar structure that I tried to foreshadow at earlier in the video. We have a diagonal matrix where the unique eigenvalues lie along the main diagonal. So, so what does this tell us, right? And, and, and here's where we're going to connect everything together. We can, we can write out the same matrix in two different bases by saying that they're similar to each other. That was the whole B equals P inverse AP equation, right? We said that, or let, let's do this, let's do this. Just so I can keep the notation consistent. A and B are similar if that's true. We said, moreover, or additionally, A is diagonalizable if A is written with a diagonal matrix like this, where, where the matrix in here is diagonal. And I conveniently put lambda one, zero, zero, lambda two. P has not changed going from here to here. So P, let's keep in mind, P was the change of basis matrix. So to connect everything together, what we are saying is that normally, normally, in the general case, we started off with these two bases right here. The error basis and then the swivel basis. Okay. Trying to get to the punchline. <laughs> error basis and squiggle basis. If that squiggle basis is not just any basis, but it is in fact the eigenbasis, then when you rewrite your matrix A in terms of the eigenbasis, you get a diagonal matrix that looks like this, okay? So in other words, 
A is diagonalizable if it has an eigenbasis. And that is, that is the connection. That connects everything together. If when, when you, um, yeah, so, so basically if you have a matrix and you can rewrite it in terms of its eigenbasis, you will get a diagonal matrix. Okay. Now, it's a lot to take in at once, right? So, so hopefully that in itself makes sense. Um, what I'm gonna do now uh, is, is first recommend that all of what I just said, try to make sure those ideas are stick and it's a lot of steps to, to follow, but hopefully they, they make sense. I'm gonna erase the board now because I'm clearly getting all over the place. And we're gonna show why this is actually useful. Why do we care about diagonalizable matri matri matrices being matrices which have eigenbasis? Why is that important? So I'm gonna erase that and then that will be the last part for the video. Okay, so to, to finish out the video, we're gonna show why all of this stuff is, is useful and I'm gonna to try to do it rather concisely, as best as my version of concisely is. Right? So, so to do this, uh, I'm gonna to try to draw out a, a diagram and explain in words why this is so important. So let's say, for example, I have a matrix A and A is diagonalizable, meaning it has an eigenbasis. And I want to take this matrix A and act it on a vector X. I know that a matrix times a vector is just going to give me some new vector, and let's call that Y. So one way of computing this is the direct, directly taking A, multiplying it by X, and let's put this a little bit lower, and giving us the output vector Y. That is one method of, of doing this. And, and just bear with me for a second. You might, this might look more complicated initially, but there is a, there's a good reason for why I'm gonna be doing this. So what we can do is if we recognize that A is diagonalizable, there is now a new fundamental approach for performing this operation as opposed to direct multiplication A times X. First thing that we could do with our vector X, and let me actually just do this. Let me say I have a vector X and I want to get to my output vector Y. One way is by directly multiplying by A, okay? Another approach is to take X, and this is going to be X starting in the standard basis, because most vectors that we write out are in the standard basis, unless otherwise specified. And we first perform a change of basis matrix to rewrite X as, or, or to rewrite X in the eigenbasis of A. The way that we would do that is with the change of basis matrix P inverse acting on X. So now this quantity, P inverse of X, this is X, we can write this is X in the eigenbasis. So at this point, we still have not performed the actual transformation, the physical uh, uh, movement that A specifies going from X to Y. All we've done is we've changed the language of X going from the standard basis into the eigenbasis. Now what we can do is once we have rewritten our vector in the eigenbasis, let's perform the transformation matrix based off of how it's defined in the eigenbasis. And what did we just learn? We, we, just, we just saw that a matrix, when written in the eigenbasis, is a diagonal matrix. I'm going to write that matrix as D for a diagonal matrix. So, so then this is the quantity D acting on P inverse X. So this converts to the eigenbasis. This performs, let's even write this, converts to eigenbasis. Then here, once we're in the eigenbasis, let's perform the, the transformation by multiplying it by a diagonal matrix. And now we have some vector. This is DP inverse is a matrix times a vector. The overall output is gonna be some vector. And this now is the output vector, what Y would look like, but it's written in the eigenbasis. But for our original problem, and for many problems, we want to write our vectors in standard basis. 
So now we just need to take this vector and take it from the eigenbasis, convert it back into the standard basis. The way we do that is with just our other change of basis matrix. So then we can write convert back into standard basis. And that would be P D P inverse is Y. Okay. So up until this point, we've seen the immediate approach, just multiply A by X. Now we take this three step approach. And the, first, the obvious question is why would you ever do this? <laughs> this seems more complicated than the direct route. And I agree visually that does, right? But, but let, me, let me try to motivate this because this, is, this shows up a lot in real world applications. This looks simple because we can always say, let's theoretically take a matrix multiplied by a vector, right? Well, what happens in, in real life if, if you have a matrix and it's really large? Let's say this is like 10 million by 10 million size. So you're taking a 10 million by 10 million matrix, multiplying it by a 10 million sized vector, you're working in R10 million. <laughs> Computationally, that will take an incredibly long amount of time. Okay. Now, you can also argue the, the fact that converting to the eigenbasis and converting back will take a long amount of time. I agree with you. So it seems like even when you increase the size of these matrices to really large data sets, this eigenbasis approach isn't immediately useful. But when it becomes useful, is, is it, it helps if the size is larger, but where it's really useful, it's really useful. And, and the main point that I want to get across is if you are going to try to take this matrix and multiply it by X, not just a single time, but over many different times. Let's say we don't just want to perform A times X. We want to perform A to the N times X. So maybe take N to be 10 million if you want. Or just take it to be a really large number. What we can do is if A has an eigenbasis, is we can rewrite A as this quantity, P, D, P inverse to the N times X. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to expand this out by writing this out literally N times. I guess you'd have to know what N is, right? But hear me out here. We're gonna go PDP inverse. This is the first time. This is the second time, all the way through the N time. Acting on X, all right? And we have a massive product of matrices here, N different quantities of the thing in parentheses. But what's nice about matrix multiplication is that it's associative. So I can reorder the parentheses. I can multiply any two matrices as long as I don't interchange the order. Notice I have a P inverse and a P right here. Those cancel. I have a P inverse and I'm going to have a P right here. Those cancel. This will keep going consecutively until I have P inverse here and a P right here. Those cancel. And what I'm left with is P on the out the very outer part, on the leftmost part. I haven't been able to cancel any of the D factors, so I can have D, and I have N of those factors, so this is D to the N, and then I have a P inverse on the leftmost part of this, times X. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. If you were to perform A to the N times X, and that takes a while computationally, Let's, then you're gonna have to perform a long computation n different times, where n can be whatever you want. If a is diagonalizable, you can rewrite a to the n as p d to the n p inverse. Computing p inverse will probably take a while. Computing p, well, let me first say, computing p will probably take a while. Computing p inverse will probably take a while. But multiplying diagonal matrices is incredibly quick in compute when, when doing this computationally. It is, it is significantly, and if you don't believe me, just take a couple of small cases. Take a two three by three matrices, maybe one arbitrary three by three and another arbitrary three by three, and then take them where they're both diagonal. See which one's quicker. Computing large factors of a diagonal matrix is significantly quicker than computing large factors of an arbitrary matrix. 
So diagonalization can be used to significantly increase the efficiency of a computer that is trying to run a computation like this. And, and not just computers, but, but again, try doing this by hand for, for large values of n, and, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so. Um, yeah, yeah, we're gonna stop it there. I, this is long enough, right? Um, I, I realize this video was, was a while, probably it's a longer video, but I really just wanted to get it all in, in a single one, wanted to make these connections. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing this. Hopefully you had fun uh, watching this and, and you learned something along the way. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys in the, in the next one.